Okay then. Wow. Hopefully we're getting some good music going. But it's also good to be able to just interact with our people once again. I'm sorry we're off to a late start. I just wanted to make sure that we gave everyone an ample opportunity to jump on. And please let me know if the volume at any point cuts out or chips out or anything. Um, it's important that we are able to hear what's going on so just let me know if it cuts out in any way but it's good to have you all here tonight i see we have a lot of persons i don't know if everyone is still on right now i hope everyone is jumping on still we so want to say good night to faye nads steven cynthia angeline craig um, Zena, Terine. So, good night, everyone. I am excited to be here with you guys tonight. So, yeah. So, great things are afoot. And I want us to be able to um have a good interactive session tonight there's some information i'd like for us to go through the topic for tonight's presentation is the seven keys to getting and staying well and i want to make sure that we all have an opportunity to um you know share what we know so that others can benefit as well um unfortunately we don't have an open mic situation as will be the case if we're doing this via zoom but um you are welcome to type in your comments in the chat section which i will periodically check i might be a few seconds behind in terms of recognizing it but as soon as i'm able to check on it and get that to you um, to get an answer going i'll be more than happy to do that so it is with no further ado that we get started with tonight's class. So here we go. So the topic is the seven keys to getting and staying well. And it is my hope that you will be able to get some info that is going to be helpful, right? So the seven keys to getting and staying well. The first one is, as we are trying to understand this whole thing of healthcare, for me, it is important that people make unemotional decisions when it comes to their health and I am totally against the idea that we ought to be trying to use fear as a justification to get people to do what they ought to do I think the use of fear is not only is it unethical but it is impossible for people to be able to objectively think when they're fearful and so any decision that somebody makes that is based on fear ceases to be ethical in my opinion and so even if you end up making the right choice if the right choice comes about through fear then the does the end justify the means yeah, it doesn't end just by the means. And we can use this um, concept in different scenarios to understand, you know, what it would be. And you have to determine that for yourself, right? But for me, 
the end certainly doesn't justify the means and I think that people need to be able to be provided with appropriate information so that they can make wise choices, correct choices for themselves and their families that's in their own best interest and, and, and the best interest of their health. All right, so that's how I look at things. So shall we begin, yeah? So the seven keys to getting and staying well, key number one, the understanding of what we mean by sick care and how that applies to the current healthcare system model. So when we're talking about sick care, sick care is the is treating persons or treating your clients based on an illness that they have and not necessarily trying to optimize their health. You see, there are two ends of the spectrum when you talk about the, the health continuum. At the top of the spectrum, you have um, optimal health and vitality. And at the bottom of the spectrum, you have death and disease. The, a wellness approach considers trying to optimize health, trying to achieve the upper limits of health and vitality versus the sick care model which is the model that predominates currently in mainstream med mainstream healthcare is one that tries to prevent death and disease so but they're on opposite ends of the spectrum preventing death and disease optimizing health and wellness and because the sick care model is based on preventing death and disease you almost certainly have to wait until something has gone wrong first and then try to intervene and so what do we do we wait until something has gone wrong and then we try to act and the definition of that we call that a reactive system so i'm going to ask that if you are able to just make some jottings make some notes feel free to do so so sick care by virtue of its focus on illness necessarily is a reactive model meaning that something has to go wrong first if you want to have a chance of optimal health and wellness you can't simply wait for things to go wrong first you have to make choices in anticipation of what can go wrong to prevent them from going wrong in the first place and so I encourage persons to try to think more in that along those lines because we have a better chance of achieving optimal health if we preemptively live our lives so if we know that eating a, a, a plant-based diet primarily will lower the likelihood of us developing heart disease and then instead of eating a plant-based diet we eat all the meats that we want and then wait until the disease sets in and then when heart disease comes in then we want to switch over to a plant-based diet that is not pre pre preventative that is a reactive approach right we are waiting until something has gone wrong first um, there are many people who treat all aspects of health that way and hopefully by the time we're done tonight I would have convinced more of you to not think that way so the sick care model is reactive and if you want to have a, a, a true chance a good chance a realistic chance of achieving optimal health then we can't wait for that to happen we have to change our approach and the approach has to be to one that is more proactive a proactive approach is way more important than a reactive approach what do we mean by proactive we mean that we are setting things up in anticipation of so as to prevent the onset of something going wrong so we're not waiting for it to go wrong first we're doing the things that we know we ought to do to prevent the event from happening in the first place driving your car a seat belt is a preventative strategy Rather than driving and waiting until an accident happens and then trying to put on a seatbelt or waiting to see the police to put on a seatbelt. If you put on your seatbelt before you drive out, 
then that is an that is one way of having a proactive approach yes you're doing something in anticipation that if something were to happen down the road you would have set things in motion to increase the likelihood of your survival yeah so that is the approach right but we are in a crisis situation right now as it pertains to health clearly i don't think anyone can argue with that and the issue that we have right now as it pertains to health is that we are in a crisis how many of us are aware that we're in a crisis if you did not know that then you may be setting yourself up even further for um, challenges to occur the challenge that we have with healthcare right now is that we're spending more money on drugs and surgeries we're spending more money on radical interventions we're spending more money on um, these approaches but the problem with these approaches is that they don't achieve optimal health and the problem too with these choices or these um, methods like drugs and surgery is that they're not even treating the cause of the problem if it is that we are sick because we are making we're eating unhealthily or we are sick because we are toxic we're exposed to too many toxins in our environment or we are sick because we are living in a stressful en environment we have a stressful job we have a stressful home life we are living with stress through and through if this be the case then how can drug and drugs and surgery be the solution you go to the doctor because you have high blood pressure and more time is being spent looking for a disease than looking for the number one reason for our blood blood pressure to go up in the first place do you know the number one reason for our blood pressure to go up is stress simple as that that's the number one reason there is no disease process that happens on a large enough scale to account for the majority reason why people have high blood pressure how much are we spoken to by our doctors about managing our stresses how much are we looking at our lives to see is there any way that we can reduce our stress exposure so as to increase the likelihood of our maintaining good health do we even ask those questions so we need to start looking more at lifestyle changes for lifestyle problems because drugs and surgery cannot solve a lifestyle problem and that is the bottom line and feel free if you agree or disagree to comment all right feel free to comment right there because i think it'll be very important to, to hear how you think to hear what you guys think right now there is a mindset that must be fixed in order for us to ensure that we achieve optimal health there's a mindset that we have that must be fixed and what is this mindset this mindset is that we are trained to think about health in a way that is not healthy remember we talked earlier about the sick care versus health care well if you're looking at the continuum of health again and if you look at the continuum when you look at optimal health at the top and death and disease at the bottom if you move if you're moving up toward optimal health you're moving in a direction we call wellness but if you're moving down toward death and disease then you're moving in a direction that we call illness so illness versus wellness is the situation 
that we have to kind of um, navigate and work through. And so if you want to achieve optimal health, then we have to think according to the wellness model. The illness model was taught to us. It was taught to us by the pharmaceutical industry and we have bought it up. Most people don't even realize that the pharmaceutical industry is the probably the, probably the largest contributor to um, the funding of mainstream media. If you want to know who is paying for media, who is paying for whether it is our local TV stations or um, a TV station overseas or whatever the case is, if you want to know who is paying for it, look at the ads. Listen to the ads that are being run. The ads are what pay for these shows and see what ads are run the majority of the times. Yes, you may have some car ads. Yes, you may have some um, small companies that share information. But the main ads that are run are drug ads. And they teach us how to think about health. They tell us quite categorically that if we have, if we have um, a headache, we need to be taking a particular pill. If we're having psoriasis or some other skin condition, then there's this drug that we can take that will give us a chance of having clearer skin. Clearer skin is possible. Um, it may cause infections. It may cause disease. It may cause death. But clearer skin is possible. You know, manipulation that happens at the hands of the pharmaceutical industry um, I think we need to be aware of it so that we can protect ourselves if you're not aware then you'll be able to get taken advantage of you know more easily so we have to become more aware so let's look at it now there are three things that we are taught or three ways that we are taught to think that are according to the illness model that I'd like to change for us the first way is um, if something happens to you, you want to just you ask the question that you ask is what can I take to feel better? You know what I mean? It's like you're thinking about a drug that can be given to you that will ease your pain or ease your suffering or make you feel better. The problem with that question is that there are many drugs that one can take that can improve how you feel without improving how you actually are and if it improves how you feel and all you care about is how you feel then that drug can be used to take advantage of you but if you ask a different question instead of asking what do i need to take to feel better if you ask what do I need to do in order to get better? Then it's a different thing altogether because now you're looking at achieving a better state. Not just feeling like you're in a better way, but achieving a better state. A state of better health, right? So getting better. If that's all you, the question that you ask, then you might not be as quick to take the pill. Because if you have a headache and you say, what do I need to do to take, what do I need to do to feel to get better? Then you might be thinking, hmm, can this pill help me to get better? Or is it simply just to get me to feel better? And don't get me wrong, you know, for some people, sometimes feeling better is what they need in the moment or what they perceive themselves to need in the moment. And if, you, if, if all you want to do is feel better without necessarily knowing if you're getting better, then sometimes taking a painkiller might be what you want to do. But if optimizing health is what you want, then you have to ask a different question question we have to ask a different question how about this one getting well have you ever gone to the hospital to visit somebody who is sick and you bring out a card with you and say here take this get well soon card right because the idea of getting well does not confer any action to it the idea of getting well is more of a wish. You're hoping that the person will get well. You're wishing that, you know, 
they will wake up tomorrow and that they will no longer need to be in the hospital and they can go home. You're not thinking about what they need to do to change the situation that they're in to improve their lot so that they can become healthy and to stay healthy, stay well. No, you want them to just miraculously achieve it. Well, the problem is that wellness is not a, is not a destination to attain. It is a journey to be on. It, it is a process. It is a it, it is an ongoing path that one must travel in this idea about wellness. You see, wellness is not the destination. Wellness is what you do to day in and day out to get to, to, to optimize your health. It is a process, it is a journey. I remember driving to the country once where my goal was just to go to visit somebody in St. Elizabeth. And that was my goal. I didn't care about the journey. I just wanted to get to visit that person. It took three and a half hours. I mean, did you know it can take you three and a half hours worth of driving from Kingston to St. Elizabeth? Three and a half hours? St. Elizabeth is not a small, not a small parish, you know. And there are some parts of St. Elizabeth where the road is not so great. And so as I was driving there, it was a very long drive for me. I didn't enjoy that trip. Finally, when we got to the person's home, I was very happy to finally have reached. And then by the next day, boom, we're on the road again to head back home. <laughs> that was rough, right? There are many people who try to, um, who want to have a better quality of life and they understand that the nutrition, what you eat is important. But to get them to become vegetarians or to get them to put aside certain fast foods and so on is very difficult for them. It's difficult for them because of what their focus is on. If your focus is on the destination, then the journey becomes arduous. Now, there's another time that I was driving through St. Elizabeth and the goal was not to simply get somewhere, but really to experience the journey of going to, I was going to the grill at the time, but at this time, I just, the goal was really to enjoy the scene of Jamaica. They, you know, go through, um, you know, I don't know the bamboo place that we have, bamboo walk, I don't remember what it's, what it's called, um, but to just go to the different places of Jamaica and just enjoy it, right? And I can tell you when we got to Santa Cruz and we drove through Santa Cruz and we were going on our way um, to get to Negril, it was, a, it was an enjoyable journey. It was almost just as long, but it was very enjoyable. And it was enjoyable because I was able to see the sights. I was able to see the coastline. I was able to see um, Holland Bamboo. <laughs> I was able to see all these different areas and it was wonderful for me and so this is this is important for us right because we need to understand that um, our mindset can determine whether we have a good easy journey or whether the journey is difficult and so for those people who for whom it is just a destination they just want to lose weight their goal is to lose weight and they get on a diet they find themselves restricting what they otherwise would be eating and they check the scale and the scale hasn't moved in two months and they get frustrated why are they frustrated they're frustrated because of their focus but if your understanding is in the right place and you realize that it's not just about getting to lose weight, that's important, but it is the process of eating healthily and how that's going to change your body slowly over time and how you're going to have a deeper appreciation for what it is that you're eating 
and all these things that make the, the, the wonders of, of wellness important, um, then I think we have a better chance of, of enjoying the journey. You know what I mean? So, and that's, that's how it is for me because whenever I, I, right now, I've switched over to a vegetarian lifestyle, right? I used to eat fish only that I started in 2013 and I switched over from fish only in November of last year to a completely vegan diet. And I can tell you, yeah, at times I miss my fish, I miss my steamed fish, I miss my brown stew fish. And if I talk about it long enough, I'll probably have to hang up and go break this vegan thing, right? But it's not been difficult because it is not about the end result of eating in a different way. It's what it is doing within my body as time is going by. That, for me, I'm excited about that because I'm seeing changes in how my body operates. I'm seeing changes in when I get sick, how quickly I recover, um, how fatigued I feel, how tired I feel, how alert I am, how awake I am, and all these things that are happening as a consequence of changing the way I live. And it's exciting to me. And I enjoy it. And so the journey has been good. So watch now. Instead of just simply saying you want to get well, how about what do I need to do in order to stay well? Because if your focus is on staying well, then you'll realize that the goal is not the destination. The goal is the journey. And that is where the beauty of it comes in. The beauty of it. How about staying alive? You know, there are people who believe that um, the fact that we have life expectancy is increasing um, so the healthcare system must be doing a good job you know is 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 probably one of the biggest um, things that are used to trick people into accepting that the healthcare system is really doing a great job at health right if you want to know if we're doing a good job of health, look at the health numbers. Because with all the money that's being spent on drugs and surgeries, still the number one cause of drug-related death are properly prescribed medication. Did you get that? The number one cause of drug-related death happens to be properly prescribed medications. In other words, it is not from doctor error. It is not from illegal street drugs. It is from properly prescribed medication. That's the number one cause of drug-related death. Many people didn't even know that. And so, the whole drug scene is something that we need to understand and understand well so that we can make choices to protect ourselves, right? Now, let me show you how life expectancy works. If half of the population dies at 100 years old and the other half of the population dies at 2 years old, then the average life expectancy would be 51 years. I mean, it's not that, right? It's not that bad. More, than, Way more than half people, well, no, half of people will not live to be 100, but certainly um, half the people will not die by two. But just as an example for easy numbers, right? Half live to be 100, half die at age two. The average life expectancy is 51 years. 102 divided by two, 51 years so if the life expectancy is 51 years how can we move that life expectancy to 60 years well to move that life expectancy to 60 years we have to do one of two things because I have to now move it up by 10 by well almost 10 8 years right or 9 years 
Well, to move it up to 60, we'll need an average of 120 years. How do we get an average of 120 years? Well, you can either increase the 50% of people to live to be 140 and then or 138 which is not practical not possible and then the other half being two will be 104 sorry let's try that one more time increase them to 120 um 118 so they increase 18 years on top of the 100 year old people already and then add that to the two year olds and you will be at 120 divided by 2, which will be your 60 years old. To increase your life expectancy from 51 to 60, you can either add 18 years to the 100 year old people or add 18 years to the 2 year olds. Which do you think is easier to achieve? You see what I mean? It's easier to try to save the life of the newborns. And get more of them to live to see 20, 30, 40, 50 years, 70 years. If you can move those two-year-olds that were dying and save them so that they can add 30, 40, 50 years. You're talking about adding decades to a set of people. Then when you average it out back, You'll be surprised to see your life expectancy, your average life expectancy of the population moving from the 51 to 60 to 70. You see what I mean? So the reason people, the life expectancy now in Jamaica, I think it's like 78 or something. The main reason for that is not because of the old people living longer. The main reason for the life expectancy being what it is, is because we're not having children die as young. Once upon a time, a lot more kids were dying in the hospital. We still have a lot of kids dying in the hospital, right? Um, at birth or in the first two years of life. But the reality is not as bad as it used to be. And, it's, and the better we can do at that is the longer the life expectancy of the population is going to be. And so the numbers will look better. Well, rather than simply having as our goals how long somebody lives, what about the quality of life? Have you ever considered how somebody lives rather than how long somebody lives it's the quality of life that is critical and that's how i look at it right because what's the point in living long if you're not living well you know what i mean so i want to have i want to feel as alive as i do right now when i'm 90. and that's what is, that is the key so my hope is that we will understand that by making these sort of changes in our thinking, we can move away from the illness model over to the wellness model. That is more important because according to illness care, the illness care model says that we want to just feel better. The wellness care model says that we want to get better. According to illness, getting well is the goal, but according to wellness, staying well is the goal. And in the illness way of thinking, you just want to stay alive, live as long as you can. But in my estimation, it is way better to not only stay alive, live, a, stay alive, but to feel alive. So feel better becomes get better. Get well becomes stay well. And stay alive becomes feel alive. Instead of feel, get, stay, we get, stay, feel. See, subtle difference in thought can make all the difference in how we function. Let us continue, shall we? Is pain a good thing or a bad thing? And we are we're rounding home now. Is pain a good thing or a bad thing? Some people say good, some people say bad, but the bottom line is that there's a purpose to pain. Um, it alerts us that something has gone wrong, doesn't it? And it also tells us that we need to do something about it. Because if we do nothing about it, then we will continue 
to will continue to do badly right yeah Craig I see you um, I figured you would say bad thing <laughs> um, and some other people would agree some people might say good thing yes Derry Berry Darian I see you would say good thing so Darian disagrees with you Craig Christine disagrees with you Craig what are you gonna do about it are you gonna stick to your guns are you gonna <laughs> switch over and say uh, say good now <laughs> but you know there is a purpose to pain regardless of whether we think it's good or bad there is a purpose and the goal is to be able to you know get the most out of that purpose right and indeed yes no pain no gain so they say but here's this right um, irrespective of whether pain is good or bad there is a problem and the problem is that you can't trust pain to tell us when something is wrong all the time because sometimes there are things that are going wrong but we don't feel any pain to warn us and because we don't feel any pain to warn us we don't make different choices right um, <laughs> and yes if we don't have the pain we don't know that there's an issue yes there you are um, but here's the problem is that you can feel good but not have good health I don't know if anyone was ever aware of that I know persons who were running a marathon this week and next week they die of a heart attack you know they they are fit enough to run a marathon a marathon is 26 26 miles about right and if you can run 26 miles you must be in pretty good health or physical fitness rather i should say because fitness and health are two totally different things and just because you're in good fitness does not mean you're you're in good health and so you might not have any pain you might not be suffering you might be as fit as a fiddle but you might be diseased and may actually be close to death and not even know it i found out just today that um you know a person that works for the company i purchased my vehicle from has just recently died and it it was it was shocking to me it was shocking to me and the thing about it is that um we don't know what method death can take to come for us you know sometimes people might be as healthy as a horse but they can be in a car accident and that takes their lives or they might be walking and slip and hit the back of their head this is how i lost my uncle um he was 59 years old i believe it was and you know tripped on the stairs and hit the back of his head and that was it you know he had to be in a medical induced coma and eventually he died so and he was pretty healthy so life and death the power of life and death rests in god's hands and god's hands alone all we can talk about is not how long we live is how well we live and so it's the quality of life that is important right and how we feel is good but it doesn't tell us that we're healthy you know what i mean feeling alive is important but it's not just about feeling alive it's also about making sure that you do whatever you can to get better if there's an issue and to do the things necessary to enjoy the wellness journey by staying on it you know so it's not just to say you're gonna feel alive and that's all you do right and so this is important right now watch this carefully right because good health good health means healthy function good health means healthy function our bodies must be working properly to be able to get the most of it so we need to start trusting how, how our body is working and not how our body is feeling right trust our function not our feeling to guide us to let us know 
whether we need to make any changes in our lives. So it's not about pain anymore. It's about making wise choices in life. So if you look at the different systems of the body, and there are several different systems. The immune system, the digestive system, cardiovascular, integumentary, respiratory, endocrine, reproductive, excretory, musculoskeletal, skeletal, nervous system. Um, I don't remember if I had said immune system, but these are the systems of the body. And if any one system is not working properly, can we claim to have good health? Good health? Can we claim to have good health if any one of these systems is not working properly? And the answer is no. We cannot claim to have good health at all if our system is not working well. So that's very important. Very important, right? But look at this carefully because I want you to understand that even though all the systems have to be working well in order for us to be well, there is one system that is considered to be the master control system of the body. Meaning that if that system is not working properly, then it can affect the function of every other system. And if that system is working properly, then it can regulate properly the function of every other system. So what is that system? That system is our nervous system. That system is our nervous system. So look carefully, please. Because as we look at the nervous system, we will see that the nervous system is made up of the brain and the spinal cord, which runs down through the middle here, that white band right there, that's the spinal cord. And the spinal cord runs through the entire length of the spine down into the lower part of the back, right? But as we look at the system, the, the nervous system, which has a brain and spinal cord, there are little yellow and blue lines that run to each organ, each of our organs. The blue and the yellow goes to each thing. So if you look at the heart right here, you see that the heart has a blue line as well as a yellow line that goes to it. The blue line provides information that will speed up the heart and the yellow line will provide information that will slow it down. So the way that the, the, the nervous system controls the function of the organ systems is by speeding up or slowing down its function. And this is how it works. This is how it works. And so it is important for us to ensure that we are treating the nervous system with urgency, with importance, because it is very important. Because if it's not working well, it can mess up everything else. If it is working well, it can help to regulate everything else. And so even if you're cardiovascular system is not perfect. If your nervous system is working well, it can help to regulate its function so that it functions more appropriately than if it were not, the nervous system were not working well at all. And so watch carefully, please, because the nervous system is considered the mass control system of the body. A misalignment in the spine because the nerves of the, the nerves that travel through the spine can be impeded if the bones of the spine are out of alignment. Very important. And a vertebral subluxation causes nervous system dysfunction. A vertebral subluxation, and that's a name given to a misalignment. It's called a vertebral subluxation. 
it causes the nerves to not function properly. So I'm going to show you something here. Hopefully it makes sense to you. If you look at this diagram, the middle bone right in here is out of line with the rest. Can you see that? So can you see that they don't line up? Now there's an opening right here between the bones where the nerves used to exit between the spine to get to the body. Now look at what happens to the opening for the bone that is out of alignment. The misalignment closes off the opening which causes the bones to now close off the space where the nerve needs to travel. And because of that, there is a chance that the nerve can be impinged. If the nerve gets impinged within the space, the sp we call that space the IVF or foramina, fore foramen is, is the singular. That opening, if it closes off, can interfere with the function of the nerve. And what if this nerve is a nerve that controls the proper secretions in the stomach? Then you might not have the proper amount of secretions in the stomach. Or what if that nerve is responsible for um, your the rate of your breathing? Then it may affect the rate of your breathing and your breathing rate might be thrown off. I don't know if you know people who they are in a car accident and then later on they notice that they start to have rapid heartbeats. Rapid heartbeats is a consequence of trauma to the spine because the nerve that controls the rate of the heartbeat can be impeded, which can change the rate of the heart to either beat faster than it's supposed to or slower than it is supposed to. This is how our nervous system interacts with the functions of our body. And so it's important for us to understand that. I hope it makes sense, right? Now, there are different types of stresses that happen in our environment, um, physical, biochemical, and psychological stresses, and that these stresses are different types of things that can impact our function depending on how our bodies um, adapt to the stress. The better our bodies adapt is the better we're able to cope with our stress. So we call it um, our adaptive potential. So the healthier the nervous system is the better our ability to adapt to our environment because it's the nerves that, that get us to respond appropriately. When the time is cold, it's our nerves that perceive the cold. Once we perceive that we're cold, then it sends a signal to the brain and then the brain will change how the body operates. It will reduce the amount of sweating. It will reduce the amount of um, different functions, increase the contraction of the muscles that cause the hairs on your skin to stand up, which will trap air closer to the surface of the skin to keep us warmer. So there are many things that happen in response to changes in our environment. And it was our nervous system that pick up on these changes. So when we look at the general adaptive potential, I want to try to show you something that's important here. Because the lower our lo lower limit of adaptation is, um, when you look at, okay, so let me say it, start over. For key number five, we're talking about our general adaptive potential, which is our ability or potential for our bodies to adapt to our environment. As I said before, our adaptive ability is determined by our nervous system in part. And so the health of the nervous system is the better we are able to adapt to our environments. So when we look at it, if we look at it as a gap analogy, every gap will have a lower limit and an upper limit. The space between the two represents what we call the gap, general adaptive potential. The wider the gap is the closer we approach vitality. And as the gap narrows, we're approaching death. 
It is the stresses in our environment that push down on our upper limit and cause our gap to get narrow. So if we are having an environment that is very stress-filled, then it will push down on our ability. We won't be able to adapt to our environment as well. The only thing that we have in our protection or in our defense is our internal resistance. This internal resistance is what allows our bodies to resist the coming down or the lowering of the upper limit. Now, if our external stresses outweigh our internal resistance, then it's going to cause our upper limit to fall down. And our life experiences, which we hope will operate completely within the boundaries of our ex existence, the life experiences are important for us because as long as they occur within the, the boundaries of our adaptation, we can adapt to it. We only fail to adapt to something if it exceeds our upper limit of adaptation. So if our external stresses overpower our internal resistance, then what ends up happening is our potential is lowered. And now areas where our life experiences would have exceeded our gap are now areas where we are vulnerable to disease. For some families, this might be diabetes. And so in your family, maybe you're vulnerable to diabetes. And if you are vulnerable to diabetes, then there is a greater chance of you now developing diabetes if you allow your internal resistance to fall or allow the external stresses in your environment to overpower you. And that's why even if everybody in your family is diabetic, if you don't live the way they lived, then you could possibly live without ever developing diabetes. But because it is a hotspot for your family, it might be the first place that you will succumb to something if it is that you fail to take the necessary steps to keep yourself healthy. So maintaining optimal health is important. Chiropractic, chiropractic improves the function of our nervous system. Chiropractic improves the function of our nervous system. And because chiropractic improves the function of our nervous system, and it is our nervous system that allows us to adapt to our environment, then chiropractic is a tool that can be used to improve our ability to adapt to our environment. But it is not the only tool. Because it doesn't matter how many adjustments you get. If you do not live your life in such a way as to maintain optimal health, you're going to have a too great a chance of, of having a problem, right? So you have to ensure that you're living your life in all dimensions to do what you need to do to be healthy. Not just one or two things, and certainly not just chiropractic alone. Because if you want to be healthy, if you want to be well, it, it takes a, a holistic, multifocal approach to be able to achieve that. All right? So there you have it. In our office, we have invested in technology that allows us to be able to identify subluxations wherever and whenever they occur. Um, we have two pieces of technology that we use to assist us to identify what's happening with the spine. This first one on the left is our, and it's just right here, right there, <laughs> on, over my shoulder, my left shoulder. Um, it's called our surface, our, our rolling thermal scanner. It's a device that we roll up the back, and it allows us to know what's happening with the spine as far as the temperature of the skin. And further over, further over, um, 
This is the surface electromyography, which tells us what's happening with the surface of the skin. If the muscles on the surface of the skin are doing what they're supposed to, right? With both these two technologies, we are able to make more informed um, guesses, if you will, as to what's the state of affairs of your spine. So we have to make wise choices, right? Um, this is one of my favorite slides because it talks about why a doctor of chiropractic or how chiropractic actually helps. How chiropractic actually helps the nervous system. Now, if it turns out that it really does help the nervous system, right? then we are expecting that it should help the brains as well. And so just to zoom in closely here, on the left-hand diagram, this is the brain before an adjustment was performed on a lady, and this was her brain after the adjustment was performed. Before the adjustment was performed, you'll see different areas of lights all over the brain. The areas of lights are areas of activity. And this corresponded to her doing a task, which was simple. It was the task that she was asked to do was to wiggle her left ankle. And because she was asked to wiggle the left ankle, it showed up as an area of almost total involvement of the brain for that one task. And that is not appropriate. Too many areas of the brain were involved. Well, she was asked to repeat the task, but this time after she was given a chiropractic adjustment. And when they looked at her brain activity, we had far fewer areas of the brain that was lighting up And because of that, this it's easier to now con conclude that in the first instance, very inefficient brain. In the second instance, very efficient brain. And the only difference between the two was that before the second test was run, they were done, a, a chiropractic adjustment was given. And so we see that the chiropractic adjustment made a difference to the function of the spine. Well, the function of the brain, certainly. And please remember to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already done so. And click the thumbs up so people can know that, you know, you like the content. All right, so moving forward, we're about ready to finish up now, right? Chiropractors are not considered to be bone doctors. Chiropractors are not bone doctors. We are nervous system doctors. Chiropractors are nervous system doctors. And that is important. Now, how about this? Most people by, by now would have recognized that I have a subspecialty within the field of chiropractic called chiropractic neurology. And as a chiropractic neurologist, I have specialized training. The regular chiropractors, as a chiropractor, I'm also trained to realign the spine, but our practice as chiropractic neurologists also include retraining the brain itself. As chiropractic neurologists, we are also equipped to retrain the brain. And so we do exercises and so on to help us to achieve this. And this is important, right, to point out. And there are many technologies that we use 
See? There you are. There are many technologies that we use to um, improve the function of our human population. <laughs> Hello, Miss Monica. And good night, Faye. And Paulette, good night. I see that. Sheila, good night as well. Mary, see you. Um, but there are many different types of patients that do come to this office that we do treat, and we have seen various degrees of success with the different types of conditions that I listed here. We're almost done now. Uh, we have to be able to identify subluxations. We have a vision here of garden, uh, garden chiropractic. We have to identify wherever and whenever a subluxation may occur. Um, provide a program of chiropractic care that can improve the function of our population and to educate our community so that we can live longer, healthier, more fulfilled lives. So that's important, right? Now, who's responsible for taking, whose responsibility is it to take care of your health? Whose responsibility is it to take care of your health? It is our responsibility to take care of our health. Whose responsibility is it to take care of the health of our kids? It's also our responsibility to take care of the, 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 the health of our kids. Because we can't expect our kids, unless they're adults, to make wise choices and to, and so on. We have a video testimonial page on our YouTube channel. So go to YouTube, look through one of the playlists, and you'll see our testimonials. Click through, look at some of them, see what you like. I like some of this. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, you'll be surprised about some of the things that chiropractic care has helped persons with. So, before I close off, I want to just extend a special offer, and I'm asking that if you have not yet indicated by putting your name in the list, Please be sure to do so in the chat section, comment in the chat section so that we can know that you're here because there's a special offer for those of you who are not a patient who would like to consider becoming patients. Um, and that is you will receive a 40% discount of the new patient examination. You get a 40% discount off the new patient examination and scan fees if you're not yet a patient who, but by hearing us here tonight, have decided to come in for care. I want to also share an email. And the email is and for this email you have to send this email to get this discount right send the email to appointments at gcnjamaica.com and as that email is sent just indicate that you were in the class and you wanted to take advantage of the 40 percent discount for new patient exams and that's all you'll have to do as a new patient Now, if you are already a patient of ours, then just a few things. And for those who have our repeat visitors to this show, this class, just understand that it's a one-time offer for this particular one. But for the first one, which is the 20% discount of your update exam, that's a one-time offer. 
if you come again you don't get a 20 percent discount again off another one it's just a one-time offer um but you also get a 20 percent discount off one treatment per person that you refer so but this one is multiple offers so if you refer five people then you can either get a treatment free by getting five 20 percent discounts off one treatment one treatment or 20 percent discount of five treatments if you refer five people or any combination and a 10% discount of the next phase of care all right so these are the different offers so for those of you who are just able to join us just make sure that you understand that um, you can rewind through to watch from the very beginning the entire presentation and still send the email at the end to get your discount if you want to take advantage of it tonight right and at the, the next phase of care and I didn't I didn't speak to this enough but there's a 10% discount of the next phase of care which is 12 treatments so if you do if you've been a part of this class and you've already come in for treatments you will get a 10% discount of the next phase of care and this one you don't have to do anything other than just to indicate um, that you are a part of the class in case that it was missed you can just send that email to appointments at gcnjamaica.com. We have our website. Our website is www.gcnjamaica.com. Or you can follow us on Facebook at gcnjamaica. Or on YouTube at Gardner Chiropractic. Or you can follow us on Facebook for our Tuesday night radio program that we have every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. called Back to Health Talk Show. And that Back to Health Talk Show is on Facebook.com forward slash Back to Health Talk Show. So that's how you can get to that. All right. You can also find us on Instagram and on Twitter as well. So for those of you who have been able to join us, I hope that you can tune in and check us out in the other platforms. I'm going to, as a, as a bonus for all of our patients who tune in to see us, and please make sure you're subscribed so whenever we do go live, you'll be alerted. But we're asking that those of you, patients of ours, um, will, I lost my train of thought there just for a second. Um, but yes make sure that you subscribe to our channel so that whenever we are live um you'll be notified of us going live and the reason that is important is that i'm planning every fifth thursday of a month every fifth thursday i'm planning on having um i'm planning on having a What do you call it? A movie time with the doctor. So we have a movie time where I'm going to go through some health, a favorite of mine, just something that I love, right? So that we can get the most out of it. So for those of us who are able to, um, feel free to, to join us, right? um on that so make sure you're tuned in all right it was a pleasure i'm going to try to stick online a little bit
for about five minutes or so afterwards to answer any questions that anyone may have. It was indeed my pleasure being able to be with you tonight. And it is my hope that you would have learned something and that you would have made the most of um, the situation. So may God bless you and keep you.